most of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll talk about blood. We'll get into the sort of anatomic orientation of the heart. And then uh, next Tuesday, we'll start to focus specifically on a cellular level. We'll look at the, the, the makeup of the cells. Um, and then we'll look at how those cells all work together as a tissue layer. We'll start, start talking about the pressures that are generated within the heart. But we can't do that without doing that anatomical background. So some of this stuff at the latter end of this lecture will be reviewed for you guys. But this is a good opportunity to take the weekend and get familiar with the anatomy and brush up on next week. Because uh, this is one of those lectures, especially the cardiovascular lecture, where we build up. You might see the anatomy, you like think, okay, I'm, I'm fine on that. You might want to, you, hopefully you don't skip it. Um, but when you get to the cells, we start talking about the cells. And then we start talking about electrical activity. We start talking about pressures. And then we combine it all together. And I assure you, if you do not keep up, the last half of this lecture is just going to blow right over your head. And that, um, towards the test, is not the time to study the material. You want to make sure that you're up to date on what you're learning. Because I've seen it before, especially when I get to the last, which is one of my favorites, it's called Wigger's Diagram. It puts it all together. And that's where I get the most blank stares. So make sure you keep up. All right. With that, uh, let's get right into our cardiovascular lecture. Uh, the, the very first bit of what we're going to be talking about is, again, um, the blood, but we'll talk about the heart. And then the last portion of the cardiovascular lecture will be the vessels. So the heart, as we know, is pretty much just an entire pump. We'll learn more about that. The three components of the cardiovascular system, the blood, the heart, and the blood vessels. I don't really spend that much time in blood, uh, but just enough that you guys get the, the gist of it. Um, we will revisit uh, the most important structure in blood, which is going to be the red blood cell. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in the vessel lecture quite a bit. Looking at our characteristics of blood, we do have about five liters of blood in adults. So that comes out to about nine pints of blood. When you do donate blood, about it's only really one ninth, well, depending, of course, on your body size. If you were to take a look at newborns, newborns actually only have about a cup of blood in their system. Um, with that, if you were to take a look at the blood and, uh, and specifically look at the uh, pH, the, uh, the alkalinity of the blood, blood has a tendency to be alkaline, meaning it's about 7.35 to 7.45. So again, very narrow window that we want to make sure that we maintain our blood because that starts to disrupt quite a bit if we start to see blood becoming more acidic, lower than 7.35, a condition that we call so acidosis would be less than. And that's going to start to seriously affect kidney function. It'll start to affect lung function. Um, it really will start to um, start to mess around with the dynamics involved and oxygen release from our red blood cells. So we want to make sure that we still maintain within them. And what we'll learn, especially towards the end of our vessel lecture, uh, when we look at our red blood cells, that we have measures in place in order to maintain that uh, pH. And that we'll learn is going to be our bicarbonate in the blood that will resist any changes in the acid levels. If we were to measure the, uh, the temperature of the body, uh, temperature of the blood, uh, blood has a tendency to be a little bit warmer. So if our core body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius, our blood is at about 30 degree, 38 degrees Celsius. Um, don't know exactly why, but that's just a, a, a phenomenon that just that takes place. If you were to take a look at the composition of blood, and we can measure the composition really by uh, what we call centrifuging, which is the process of spinning the blood in which the heavier sediment sinks to the bottom and the lighter sediment, or let's say the lighter portions of the, of the blood, will flow. And so this separation that takes place in the centrifuge will actually separate what we call the formed elements, of which most of it is going to be red blood cells, which we'll talk about in the next couple slides. The other portion of it is going to be water. So water, we have about 55% water in our blood, and that would be in our plasma. Right in between is what we call a buffy coat, which is going to be our white blood cells and platelets, and again, the heavier stuff, the red blood cells, the big formed elements that you'll see on the bottom. 
you were to take a look at the bottom right, um, there's that misconception that uh, deoxygenated blood, meaning a blood that uh, is lower in oxygen content, blood in um, uh, looking at sort of your subcutaneous veins, people might think that the blood is blue, but it actually isn't. So here we can see arterial blood, arterial blood being really bright, and then here we can see deoxygenated blood. So this is blood that is low in oxygen, actually has a slight purplish tinge, and that's all related to the hemoglobin, um, which is going to have a heme group, which is iron. Iron being slightly red will interact with oxygen to give it that bright color. Uh, if we look at that plasma, which we know is about 55%, the, the top portion, which uh, is all fluid, of that plasma, 92% is water. So you can see 92% water. If we were to take a look at the other things that are dissolved in it, proteins, proteins uh, being soluble in blood, we see 7%. Uh, and of those proteins, you can see some of the other proteins that are present in here, albumins, which we already described being the lipid, uh, lipid carrier in blood. Globulins would be your, glo uh, well, your globe-shaped spherical proteins, fibrinogens being your more fibrous proteins present. Biggest bulk of them will be your albumin for carrying your lipid-soluble hormones. If you were to take a look at the uh, other solutes inside, you'll see electrolytes. Electrolytes would be things such as uh, our, sodium, uh, our sodium, charged sodium, sodium ions, chloride ions, calcium is a big one, potassium, and naturally if you were to take a look at, ener or not energy drinks, but things like Gatorade, and they talk about electrolytes. That's exactly what's in them. It's just the same salts that are gonna be involved, and, and NaCl would be would be sodium chloride. We do have potassium chloride, which is another salt. Um, uh, all these things that are going to be involved uh, in uh, uh, ions outside in the extracellular fluid as well as the intracellular fluid, which we already learned. Nutrients would be our, our vitamins, would be our minerals, uh, glucose, that's present as, as metabolic substrates. Gases would be O2, CO2, gas exchange. Uh, also, a very, very minute amount of nitric oxide, which we already learned is a uh, vasodilator. Regulatory substances would be your hormones. And then other waste products, things that we don't necessarily use that is eliminated by our urinary system. Now, the other, uh, while well, the plasma is a 55%, the other 45% are gonna be the things that sink down to the bottom. So these are gonna be our big cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, as well as platelets. And they are called formed elements because they actually are derived from stem cells. And where are those stem cells for blood located? Actually located right in the bone marrow. So our, our, our stem cells start to differentiate and, and, and at no point am I ever gonna have you memorize um, any of the um, other basophils, neutrophils, isenophils. I just want you guys to be able to see that we produce red blood cells, which, which is a chunk of it. We also produce our immune system cells in the bone marrow. So keep that in mind about how we get the stem cells, how we get our red blood cells into our bloodstream, uh, especially when we talk in our vessel lecture, or actually even a little bit more when we, yes, in our vessel lecture, that's what we talk about. Um, we see our erythro, uh, erythro, erythrocytes, which are gonna be our red blood cells. You'll see our platelets, and then our five types of leukocytes, leukocytes being our white blood cells. If you were to take a look at the biggest chunk of all the formed elements, you would note that red blood cells dominate them all. So with, in terms of our red blood cells, we do have quite a lot of them. Uh, and, uh, you can see how many uh, red blood cells, about five million red blood cells in our blood. Uh, if you were to take a look at our, uh, our platelets, we have about 400,000, so pales in comparison. And our white blood cells, even smaller fraction of that, about 10,000 white blood cells. So if you were to do the, if you were to measure this, the amount of this pellet by volume, we know it's about 45% 
of the entire sample. That would be red blood cells comprising most of the formed elements, or that pellet specifically, would be what's called our hematocrit, and that is the percentage of red blood cells. So how, how much volume is that uh, of the formed elements? This is going to be our hematocrit, the percentage by volume. Now, in order to uh, stimulate the production of red blood cells, we have what's called erythropoiesis, and we'll learn that this is gonna take place uh, uh, in, for the formation of our red blood cells. So as I, said, as I said earlier, our red blood cells are called erythrocytes. Erythropoiesis is the formation of it. So how do we stimulate erythropoiesis? How do we stimulate red blood cell production? Well, we, we get that whenever we are uh, in hypoxic conditions, meaning hypo, low, and hypoxic referring to oxygen. So go up in altitude. You may have heard, if you got up to altitude, you have to acclimate to it. And that acclimation process is erythropoiesis taking place, where our kidneys are stimulated to produce a hormone called erythropoietin, also known as EPO. EPO. And EPO, erythropoietin, is, uh, like I said, a hormone that's produced. Uh, and there are ways, given that our red blood cells are meant to carry oxygen to our active tissues. Um, it's been a phenomenon that's been the discovered in, in ways people would increase their oxygen comparing, uh, oxygen carrying capacity is through uh, stimulating erythropoiesis. So what people have done in the past, what's called blood doping, uh, they would, uh, athletes would have a tendency to, not all athletes, but those that were trying to get a competitive edge, would take a pint of their own blood and then they'd wait for erythropoiesis to take place and bring back their normal volume of blood and then right before the race, they would uh, inject that same blood back into uh, their bloodstream. And what that ended up doing was now your red blood cell count was higher, and theoretically you should be able to deliver more oxygen to your blood. However, what that, what that does is now that you're raising your uh, blood volume by 10%, that's an extra strain on the heart. So naturally what is a huge uh, side effect with doing something like that is any sort of cardiac event, right? heart attack or stroke that could take place. Uh, other ways that people have done it would be EPO injections, so they would actually inject the uh, erythropoietin and that would uh, stimulate red blood cells as well. Obviously these are things that would uh, get them kicked out if they were found. But Neil Armstrong, where the metals taken Lance Armstrong? Lance Armstrong? Uh, Lance Armstrong, I think, because uh, yeah, I think he had taken testosterone injections, hadn't he? No, he blood milk. Did he? Did he? Did yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's what people do to get an edge. I actually spent a good amount of time, too, with, um, uh, with our UCLA athletes, and a lot of them got tested. So anybody that actually was, that was diagnosed as an asthmatic had to take uh, a test where to, to see how much they would respond to... Um, to the, for the use of, of Ventolin, Ventolin being ad, an adrenergic, um, or if they were taking any corticosteroids of any kind, um, they wanted to make sure that they actually had a valid diagnosis for it. And uh, people have taken, have used albuterol to prevent any, or at least to increase the amount of air going into their lungs. Um, so in order for them to actually ha uh, be allowed to take Ventolin would be positive diagnosis for some sort of asthma. So there's a lot of particulars that are related to, uh, especially sports, uh, regulatory uh, agencies that are there to make sure that whatever medical use you have, it's justified. Um, white blood cells, if you were to see, we have 700 red blood cells to one white blood cell, <laughs> of which we have the five different types. I'm not gonna really go too much into it, because honestly, I'm not gonna test you on it. But keep in mind that we do have five types um, of which they all have different functions. And you can see that based off the next slide over, our basophils, which would be involved in inflammation. There are three neutrophils, isotophils, and monocytes, which are related to phagocytosis, or have the function for phagocytosis, meaning they basically eat any foreign cells that don't belong. Uh, our red blood cells, again, erythrocytes, uh, you'll note that the features behind them is that they are biconcave, meaning they are literally like a semi-donut shape. 
And the purpose of this is to actually increase the amount of surface area that's exposed to the bloodstream. So here, if you, if you know, um, by having a smaller type cell, uh, the, 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 the diameter of the cell is just enough to fit within a capillary. And in this image to the bottom right, you can see the, the, the width of a capillary. The capillary is the smallest vessel that's going to be able to travel nearby to the, all the nearby cells. And you can see that it literally will fold and fit right through in between. Um, that allows it to not only fit within the capillary, especially their smallest vessels where they can kind of fold like a taco and be able to make their way through. But it also gives it the most surface area to be exposed to so that the hemoglobin that's contained within, and the hemoglobin is a protein that I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, can be exposed to the most gases. And that gives it the ability to increase the surface area. So something I won't really get too much into, but it gives us the highest amount of surface area to volume ratio. We want um, more surface area exposed for the amount of stuff, the, 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 the width or the, the contents of the vessel contained within. The lifespan, if we take a look at red blood cells, do not last forever. So they only last about 120 days. So the question that you'll start to think about, especially towards our vessel lecture, is what happens with red blood cells that die? Do they just die? We just pee them out? Do we get rid of them? No, we need to get them out of the bloodstream and we need to get new red blood cells that are made back in the bone marrow back into the bloodstream. So we'll learn how, uh, what mechanism is in place, what specific feature of the capillaries are present to allow red blood cells in and out. Um, why is the lifespan only 120 days? You would specifically see that it doesn't actually, it's been stripped of all these organelles. So it doesn't have a nucleus. So there's no, no, uh, not much DNA in a red blood cell. You would see there's no protein manufacturing, meaning it doesn't have a Golgi apparatus, it doesn't have endoplasmic reticulum. Again, things that would allow our red blood cell to, uh, to assimilate to a very small shape. And then most importantly, it doesn't have any mitochondria. So the mito since it lacks mitochondria, and we know where is most of the bulk of ATP being produced? In the mitochondria? Mitochondria. Right? Okay. Uh, we know that the mitochondria was involved in the Krebs cycle. And we saw the electron transport chain where we were able to produce a bulk of all of our ATP. So therefore, if you were to take a look at that red blood cell, how do you think it would produce ATP? If it doesn't have mitochondria, how does it produce ATP? One portion that doesn't require oxygen. Fermentation. Fermentation is a step before that. That's it. That's it. First step of cellular respiration. What do you do with glucose? Glycolysis. You split it. Glucose, glycolysis. So glycolysis produces what? How much ATP? Two. two ATP per glucose molecule, right? So if you were to measure the enzymes in, in uh, a red blood cell, it would be all glycolytic enzymes. These would be enzymes that are involved in able to churn out that ATP. So technically, our red blood cells can not only get energy from glucose, but they can also get it from lactic acid as well. It doesn't actually use any of the oxygen that it carries. So because it, we know that the oxygen was heavily involved in mitochondria, it was an oxygen or an electron acceptor. And at the end of the electron transport chain, we saw oxygen picking up those high energy electrons and combining that with oxygen, a split oxygen molecule, we produced water. So therefore, since red blood cells actually don't use any of uh, <laughs> the oxygen, it's able to carry it. So that makes sense that our red blood cells would want to be delivering oxygen and not using it, so technically not using its own supply. Another thing about our red blood cells is that we uh, have a tendency to remove them after they're no longer usable after 120 days. We have macrophages in the liver that will come in and destroy that red blood cell. It'll start to chop it up uh, and it'll use those amino acids, it'll use the contents of the cell to make new red blood cells. Uh, looking at the uh, dysfunction of red blood cells, this is where you would see sickle cell disease, a disease in which 
the misshapen red blood cells, the deformities that are present in red blood cells due to a genetic disorder, uh, reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells. It's called sickle cell shape uh, uh, red blood cells that, that no longer have that semi-donut shape and therefore can't carry uh, oxygen as much. So people with sickle cell disease uh, do seem to have respiratory problems simply because they're not capable of carrying oxygen. They can do normal activities, but as time goes on, they find that they can't perform heavier activities due to the reduced carrying oxygen carrying capacity. Now, within the red blood cells, we have hemoglobin. Okay? So don't think that hemoglobin is a red blood cell. Don't get that confused. We have, uh, zooming into the, the molecular structure, it is a protein of which we have four uh, subunits that are put together to create this hemoglobin molecule. And the whole sole purpose of hemoglobin uh, is to carry oxygen to every tissue in the blood that the capillaries uh, are traveled through. And so we have about, about 300 million molecules of hemoglobin present per red blood cell. So naturally we want en uh, enough of these to be able to carry them. So not only is it carrying oxygen, but it also carries CO2. So we'll learn about this at the very tail end of uh, our cardiovascular system lecture and how does hemoglobin carry and how does it release oxygen? How does it carry CO2? And then also what it's involved in producing our bicarbonate buffer. So red blood cells and the hemoglobin specifically serve that function. Uh, if we were to take a look at the subunits, like I mentioned earlier, there's four subunits of which there's two types, our alphas and our betas that are put together in order to carry it. We'll have four heme groups, one, two, three, four, and its capabilities of carrying, uh, carrying uh, oxygen uh, as well. White blood cells we won't talk too much of, but nonetheless white blood cells can be divided by granulocytes and agranulocytes. It's the presence of these granules in the white blood cells um, that serve as, these granules serve as a lytic effect, basically the, the ability to lyse a foreign cell. So if, if there's something that doesn't belong in your bloodstream, these cells have the capability of going in and destroying that cell. So what it's looking for specifically are cells that do not belong. We're looking for things uh, based on the cell markers, things that are present on the outside of the cell that our own immune system can recognize. And I did talk a little bit about a couple of the uh, autoimmune disorders, mainly like type 1 diabetes. I did talk about Hashimoto's disease. This is, they're called autoimmune disorders because our own immune system don't recognize those cells. So they think that uh, it is a foreign agent and these immune, immune cells come in and start attacking those cells and destroying them over time. Another reason why uh, those that have transplant surgery, if anybody gets a heart transplant, kidney transplant, they have to take a lifetime supply of what's, what are called immunosuppressants to suppress the immune system from attacking tissues that are considered foreign. And we can't just take anybody else's kidney, we can't take anybody else's heart, we gotta find something that's a very close match that matches the markers on top of each cell. And I'll talk a little bit more of those markers later on. Platelets are going to serve the function of blood clotting, and they work together um, uh, with, with autocrine and paracrine signals. For the purposes of being able to aggregate around an injury. So take a vessel and nick the vessel at some point, and we want to have platelets that, that clot around that area in order to prevent any blood leaking from that point. So these platelets actually utilize ATP, so ATP to ADP, not something you really need to know, but uh, the, the, the phosphorylation of, 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 of ADP uh, forms a process in which it starts to stimulate other platelets to come stick to uh, one another. So in other words, in order to enhance the stickiness, you're going to see that platelets use ATP in order to start formulating this clot. 
If you look at the structure of platelets, you'll see again, very small. Here you can see all our red blood cells scattered around. And all these dots are going to be our platelets. So no nucleus, uh, really very limited number of cellular organelles, but mostly cytoplasm from other stem cells. So as I mentioned earlier, looking at where these are uh, originate from, stem cells, these are the remnants of them. So they are very specific platelets, a very spe special function for what they do. The other thing about platelets also, uh, because they do exhibit their stickiness, another, another thing that uh, we, well, I don't think we'll really touch on it, is what we call arthrosclerosis, is the form of plaque forming on the side of the wall. So take a fatty diet, for instance, and you start to form these clumps that, that form around a vessel. And those clumps that form together uh, create turbulence as that blood flows through. And any turbulence in that area starts to accumulate platelets around that area that will start to form this plaque wall around. And what that's going to start doing is you're going to start uh, doing something called stenosis, where it's going to start to narrow the pathway that blood can follow. So here you start to see the passage where blood can flow through start to get smaller and smaller. So that starts to reduce blood flow into that area. So that would have prominent uh, impact on, the, on any high functioning vessels or high functioning areas such as the heart where this, uh, any plaques that form that can come in and dislodge, uh, dislodge and block that area can start to reduce the ability for our own circulatory system to deliver blood to that area. So this is a condition we call ischemia. The lack of blood flow to an area that can result in the death of cells. So if you were to look at myocardial ischemia, is reduced blood flow to certain areas of the heart. The next thing is to take a look at the blood group. <laughs> so on top of the red blood cells, how we are, our own body recognizes our own red blood cells is the presence of surface markers on the cells themselves, which we call antigens. So antigen, um, if you're able to read any information on uh, with antigens, regarding uh, the, 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 the surface markers, you see that cells have glycoproteins. These are proteins with little antenna on top. So these glycoproteins with these huge carbohydrate chains right on top are markers for the cells to let them know that these are our own cells, not to attack them because we own these cells. So these antigens are present also on our red blood cells, of which we have two types of antigens that are, that are specific to us. What I'm trying to get down to is really your own blood type. How do they characterize your blood type? So the way this is uh, devised is we have two specific antigens. We have the ABO blood group, and then we have an RH antigen. And starting off with the ABO blood group, you'll see that we have two main alleles, alleles which are the types for a gene, would be A and B. And these are specific markers on top. And you can see on, on, the, on the image on our bottom here, you can see A antigen would be expressed with a purple dot, while the B antigen would be expressed with this arrow, this light blue arrow. And so, while it may not look exactly like this, this kind of gives you the idea that antigens uh, are specific too. So we do express these, and I'll talk about our ABO blood group in just a little bit. The RH antigen is another antigen that's present, of which either you're positive for it or you're negative for it. And uh, most people have these, about 85% of the population has uh, the RH antigen, so they're positive for, R, for RH. Um, and the, the importance behind this is whether you're positive or negative when we talk about our blood groups. So RH antigen is gonna be another thing that's also profound in pregnancies, because when, uh, and we don't get too much into it, but if you look at pregnancies, um, women that are pregnant can be negative, and they can have like a, a negative, they're negative for the RH antigen, but the fetus, can be positive. So that would mean 
uh, they receive that positive antigen from the father. And so that positive, uh, that RH positive baby living within an RH negative female, uh, we know that blood can't cross between the two, so that won't compromise itself. So the, the, the fetal blood can maintain separate from the maternal blood. But if there's ever any injury on the, uh, on the fetus of any kind, or any on, on the placenta or anything like that, that causes uh, fetal blood to leak out into the maternal blood, uh, the mother starts to produce antibodies against that RH antigen. It knows how to attack for it. So that has a, 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 an impact on future babies for that, that pregnant woman. Um, simply because if you, they ever have a RH positive baby, there's antibodies that would start coming and then starting to attack it uh, so it because it doesn't belong. Uh, the other portion, again, the ABO blood group, as I mentioned, there's two different uh, antigens, which are A and B, which I pointed out earlier. Um, and from what you were gathering, what I'm talking about is that the, the antigens are expressed both from the males and females. So we undergo meiosis. Uh, for the production of sperm and eggs that combined, we're gonna get half the DNA from the mother and half the DNA from the father. So we know that with, uh, with our antigens, with conception, we're gonna see the, the maternal DNA and paternal DNA come together. And so we can start to take a look at the concept of genotypes and phenotypes. Now, <coughs> genotypes genotypes are what you carry, and phenotypes are what are expressed. So, to give you an example, would be uh, would be black hair, or the the gene for black hair, as well as a gene for blonde hair. And we know. I'm thinking of uh, Game of Thrones while I think about this. Um, it would be, uh, black hair would be a dominant trait. So while a carrier, the genotype would be having both black and blonde hair, the, uh, the, the, the genes for it, the one that's expressed, the phenotype, would be black hair. So we'll start to see how that takes place, of which we're gonna have two of each allele, simply because one belongs from the mother, the other one belongs from the father. So with that, here you can see our genotypes. Let me write this somewhere else. So genotype down here, and our phenotype over here. So our genotype in this case, meaning uh, will be a carrier for um, will be a carrier for those alleles. So someone who would be type A, type A, type B, type AB, and type O. That's the expressed phenotype. What would be their genotype? meaning somebody who is type A can either have AA or AO. O being the recessive allele and A being the express allele. Hence, therefore, the phenotype would be A. So if you're, type, if you're a genotype AA, you would be blood type A. Somebody who's type B would have a genotype of BB or BO. Somebody who is type AB would actually express both antigens, AB, meaning they've gotten one A, they've gotten the A from either the mother or the father, and the B from the mother or father. And then type O would express um, no antigens, meaning they would have to be OO. So here, type O is not going to have any markers for the AB antigen, but they still will express RH antigen, either they're positive or they're negative that we didn't include on this particular slide. So with that, um, if we're to take a look at the uh, most common type, about 39% of the population is O positive, while AB negative is the rarest type, of which we have 0 0.5, 0 0.5%. So like I said, um, blood type expression. We're gonna start to look at how, uh, when we take a look at the male's genotype as well as the female's genotype for the ABO blood group. The male would have to have 
uh, his own genotype. In this case, we can make him AO. So this, in that case, his phenotype would be type A. And the female could be type B. So again, we're using the example. Even though they're type B, they're either BB or BO. But in this case, I'm just showing you BO and AO. So here you can see the different combinations based off these two alleles where uh, the male exhibits AO, A and then O, and the female is B and O. So with the different combinations of what this could be, that A allele can go to A, A and combine that with the O and then the, I'm sorry, the, the, the O and the B give you type AO, AB, BO, and OO. So how does that play out? How do we figure that out? We use what's called a Punnett square. Have you guys seen these before? Yes. So Punnett squares are fairly easy in which all you're really doing is taking the allele of the male and the allele of the female and you're putting them together. So we get AB, we get BO, AO, and O, O. And you'll see that in, in, these are the different combinations of these two. So from these, now you can see the genotypes of the offspring. So we have basically a one in four chance of any of these uh, blood types taking place. But the phenotype that's expressed would be AB, type B, type A, or type O. So those are the phenotypes expressed, of which you have uh, for AB, we have what's called codominance. Meaning that both A and B are expressed. A doesn't trump B, nor does B trump A. The one that is trumped is the O allele. So when we see BO, we see type B. Same with AO as well. And then the last one to be type O would mean you'd have to get the O allele and the O allele from the, uh, from the male and female. So with that, AB being codominance, uh, this doesn't count for the RH antigen. If we were to do a Punnett square with our RH antigen, that would have to give us a 4x4 four four square. And that makes things a little bit more complicated where we get about 16 combinations of. But for simplicity's sake, we can just look at this and then we can account for the RH antigen later. Plus, so now, based off this information, let's take a look at matching donors and recipients. So any compatibility for our donors, which are our columns on top, and our recipients, which are the rows across, the ones that are compatible are going to have the check mark with them. So here you can see anybody that is, a, that is negative, RH negative, for our recipients cannot receive any blood from anybody that is RH positive. If they were to have RH blood, let's say you get a blood transfusion of the wrong type of blood, what would happen? Well, your own immune system cells would come in and start to attack those red blood cells. They'll start to clump together. And as they clump together, they'll start to clump even more. And eventually, we'll start to clot and reject that blood. So obviously not a good thing, hence why they want to make sure that your blood types match. So uh, all of our negative for our RH antigen can only really receive blood from those that are RH negative. Um, the other thing to take a look at too is uh, those that are um, AB positive, recipients that are AB positive, can receive blood from anybody that's A, has type A blood, type B blood, they can receive blood from anybody who has positive or even negative antigen. So here they're compatible with everybody. So in this case, because they can receive blood from O positive, O negative, B positive, B negative, they're called universal recipients. So these are the lucky ones that can receive blood from any blood type for both antigens. Now conversely, here you can see O negative. And since O negative doesn't express any RH antigen, nor does it express any A or B antigens, they can donate blood that looks just like this. So therefore, they, are, they can donate to any of the blood types. 
O negative can donate to O negative. And here you can see O negative can only receive blood from O negative, but O negative can donate to every single type. Therefore, they are called the universal donors. And if you're an O negative, is anybody here O negative? You probably have, uh, have you guys ever donated blood before? Do you, do you get a lot of calls? Yeah. yeah. All the time, because you're a universal donor. So that's all it comes down to. Is anybody here AB positive? I've donated blood like how many times I still don't know my blood type. But nonetheless, uh, anyway you look at it, <laughs> anyway you look at it, if you're an O negative, which my mom was, calls all the time. I used to remember we had to take her calls because there was always the blood donation center calling out and wanting her to get to donate. And I forget how many weeks can you donate? Every 30, 30 days. Better believe they're calling you for more blood. Um, so that is being O negative, you are the universal donor. We are coming up with ways, uh, in fact, April 2007, they came out with a way to strip the antigen completely off uh, the blood itself. And uh, even though that was about 10 years ago, I don't know where the progress has been made, if we're still able to do this, but there is a what's called a glycosidase enzyme that comes in and can cleave those antigens off. So if you can take up any blood type, whether you're type AB, and then run it through with this enzyme, and there it comes off and chops off all these antigens on top, well now effectively what you have is type O blood. So with that, you would be able to create um, a universal donor type blood if you can strip the antigens. Because really all you need are the red blood cells. You need the hemoglobin contained within the red blood cells in order to boost your, red, uh, your oxygen carrying capacity. So if you're ever in need of blood and you're low because you've got low red blood cell count, you want to make sure you can get that hematocrit back up. You want to make, or if, uh, if you're anemic, you want to make sure that you can get your red blood cell count back up in order to be able to deliver the amount of oxygen that you need in order to sustain life. So if they can strip those off, well then they can work with that. Um, another thing too that's interesting about the, uh, the, that type of blood is that they've actually uh, created artificial blood as well, where they have um, stem cells, so just, just, just regular stem cells that they can start producing red blood cells without any markers. And they know what they were trying to do is mass produce red blood cells. And if we can start producing red blood cells, then we shouldn't really have as much of an issue with blood donations. Because most of the time it's really just rejection that takes place. Yes? Um, specifically, it's going to be, and, and I don't know that much about HIV, but it's not just the red <coughs> blood cells. It's specifically the the T cells that have been modified. So, so, red, blood? Um, so red blood cells. If you were to take a look at the the makeup of them, yeah. red blood cells are going to be the bulk of it. So it's not affecting the red blood cells. It's the white blood cells. So what happens with HIV positive, just like any virus, what's really cool, viruses are really cool. So if any of you guys ever study viruses, we're starting to learn to use viruses to inject DNA that we actually want. Because what viruses do, they come in, they attach to a cell, and they literally will penetrate that cell and inject its own DNA into it. So what happens with any of the viruses, and whether you're looking at cold viruses, flu viruses, they do the same thing. They come in, it, 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 it takes a host cell, and in this case, that would be the white blood cells, or the T cell, a specific white blood cell called T cells, where the HIV comes in, injects its own viral DNA into it, and reprograms that T cell to start producing more HIV uh, viruses. And every time it produces another HIV virus, the DNA that's contained within that virus starts to mutate just a little bit. There's some mutation, just like you guys learned in that lab that we did, the, the, the slight point mutations that occur that change the, the nature of the, uh, the HIV. It's still HIV, it still will affect you, but they can never really sequence HIV to say, okay, maybe we can get rid of it. Well, if the, if the, if the, if the virus mutates over and over and over again, they're always constantly playing catch up with the DNA sequence for, for, for that particular virus. Hence why when you look at flu vaccines, why haven't we been able to eliminate the flu vaccine? It's because every time it jumps from a person to person, it's gonna mutate and that mutation is going to create a new type of flu virus. And we see all the, all the things that are coming out, H1N1, all derivatives of the flu virus that come back out 
that will affect us and start to affect our immunity. So what's happening with the uh, white blood cells, they start to come in, they create antibodies for that type of cell, and now you can fight it off. So typically, if you've ever had a flu before, you might not catch that flu again because you have the antibodies stored in. But to answer your question, that's all in the white blood cells. That's where the DNA comes in. All right, so lastly, for blood, we'll, say, we'll look at blood lab results. And here is an old, old printout of our blood labs. Let me just zoom in real quick. Some things to point out. The reference ranges. Reference ranges are the expected ranges for being for your for your demographic that are produced. So you can see from uh, reference ranges represent the homeostatic balances for each of these. Here you can see a chemistry panel, and I want to just divvy this up for you, where you can see our. These would be things that are dissolved in the blood. So this is measuring, uh, a measure of the plasma, while these are going to be a measure of the formed elements. So naturally, you'll be able to see glucose levels. And again, the reference ranges of where your glucose levels should be, 136 to 144. And that's really determining whether this person is fasting or not. Uh, you'll look at sodium, potassium, chloride. These three from our chemistry panel are just measuring the electrolytes in our blood. Again, we want to be, make sure that we maintain normal values of that, because what happens when any of that is excess? I did ask you that, excess, that, that quiz question of, uh, was it a quiz question? I think it was uh, something related with potassium. What happens with excess potassium in the extracellular fluid? So naturally with that, any excess in potassium can start to affect our nerve cells from firing, the excitability of cells, and upset the balance of those. Uh, glucose, chloride, carbon dioxide are gases, creatinine, look at cholesterol levels. Um, here they can look at the metabolic panel, they can look at the proteins in, uh, present that are present in blood. Do we have enough uh, albumin, bilirubin, which is a, a byproduct from the breakdown of our red blood cells, uh, and so forth. The very bottom, we'll show you our form counts. So this is our, our, what we call our CBC, a complete blood count. And what they're really doing is looking for the counts of your, of your white blood cell and red blood cells, as well as your platelets. So hematocrit, here you can see 42.3%. That means of that pellet on the bottom that was uh, to settle, we see 42.3% of that entire blood sample is what we call our hematocrit, of which most of that is going to be our red blood cells. Here they can do uh, the amount of hemoglobin, the grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood. They can count the number of red blood cells, count the number of white blood cells. They can count also your platelets uh, from, that, uh, from that test. And then your diff, your differential, is looking specifically at your own immunity. It's looking at your basophils, your monophils, your, uh, your, uh, your, your lymphocytes, and everything else. We want to make sure that those counts are normal. Because if your white blood cell counts are high, it means you're fighting off something. They want to look at those specifically. Let's take a look at the heart. So like I said, I don't spend that much time in blood, but the heart of it, what we're gonna be talking about are the vessels. I'm sorry, yeah, we'll talk about the, uh, the red blood cells and specifically the hemoglobin in the vessels. So we'll save the best for last because that one uh, can be fairly difficult when we explore the concept of gas exchange. But the heart, uh, when again, looking at the heart, and I, like I said, most of this is review, so I'm gonna kind of speed through it if you don't mind. Uh, but if we take a look at uh, the size of the heart, basically the size of a closed fist. And it pumps about 10,000 times per day. Uh, the whole purpose of the heart is really to, to, for the transport of the blood, which is going to contain all the things that I talked about earlier. All the gases, nutrients, the hormones, uh, the proteins, and all the stuff that is present in blood. The whole sole uh, purpose of the heart is just to provide that function, is to move blood through. Um, we're going to have blood that's going to be circulating through the rest of the body, and we're going to have blood that's circulating through uh, the, pulmon uh, the pulmonary circuit, which is going to be the lungs. So looking at the location of the heart, about two-thirds of it is really going to be to the left of the midline. So here you can see the midline of the body. Two-thirds of the heart, uh, heart is on the left side of the body. 
Um, you'll see the apex of the heart is actually pointing down, down left. The, the base of the heart is going to be up, up here at the top portion. Uh, there's a slight tilt uh, to the, the heart itself where you can see the orientation of it. The, looking at the layers of the heart, if we were to take a cross section of it, you'll see we have the pericardium, para meaning outside, cardium related to the muscle tissue, the cardiac muscle fibers that you can see that are present. And the pericardium, again, is the outside fibrous layer that surrounds the heart. It fits it kind of like a glove, and it actually prevents the overexpansion <laughs> of the heart itself. So if you ever look at heart surgeries, they can see the, the, the white fibrous layer that covers it. They have to cut that through in order to be able to see the heart with, contained within. So the pericardium is actually divided into two layers, where you have the fibrous layer and the serous layer. Fibrous being the outside portion, and then the serous layer being a bilayer, where you have the, the parietal layer just tucked underneath the fibrous layer, and then you have the visceral layer uh, that's flush against the heart muscle. And in between, you're gonna have serous fluid. This is the uh, uh, pericardi uh, pericardial cavity, and that whole purpose of that cavity is to have pericardial fluid about about 35 to 40 milliliters of fluid that flows around. And that serves to lubricate the, the heart as it, as it expands and, and, and contracts and expands against that fibrous pericardium. Um, this is where the term pericarditis comes from. Uh, any inflammation, any bacterial inflammation of the heart starts to create excess fluid in that area. So now you've got this bag the pericardium that's on the outside, and you've got the heart pumping against it so it can't overexpand, you start to build up all this excess fluid in it, and now the heart can't expand as much. So pericarditis, which is again that inflammation of that uh, cavity, starts to affect how much that heart can fill up and pump blood out. The uh, other layers contained within, you can see the visceral layer, uh, and, then, and then you can see the epicardium. Uh, the uh, epicardium is a, a layer just right underneath the uh, serous layer. You'll get the myocardium, which is the thickest portion. This is where we're going to have our cardiac muscle all contained within. This is going to serve as the contractile portion of the heart that's going to be doing all the muscle motion. And then the endocardium, which is going to be the innermost layer that's exposed to the blood as it's flowing through the heart itself. So the endocardium. Uh, is also typically called the epithelium, or uh, the, the endothelium. It's the inner layer of the heart. Looking at the divisions of the heart, you can see that uh, uh, while the heart works together to pump blood, you're going to see two different chambers. Uh, you'll have or, uh, four total chambers. Of, you have two atria and two ventricles. So the atria, as you know, uh, we know are up at the top, the ventricles down at the very bottom. And the whole purpose of that of the atrium ventricles are different chambers to be able to move blood in. So as you know, the atria will pump first, the ventricles will pump second. So you're going to see the exchange of blood as it moves through, blood coming into the heart and blood coming out of the heart. And this whole mechanism that's in place is meant to direct blood out to those respective circuits, in which you can see, uh, like I said, two atria and two ventricles. Each side, one atrium and one ventricle is going to be responsible for the systemic circulation. The other one's going to be involved for the pulmonary circulation. I'll draw that out for you, uh, where we have systemic and we have pulmonary. Pulmonary being the right side of the heart and systemic being the left side of the heart. Systemic being pumping out to the rest of the body. <laughs> And if you were to take a look at the systemic circulation, here you can see that's carrying oxygenated blood out to the body. So left ventricle, when we look at a lot of the clinical measures, they're looking specifically for left ventricular function. Uh, uh, if you ever get an echocardiogram, they're looking at left ventricle ejection fraction. How much blood can you pump out the left ventricle? Obviously, you want the left ventricle to work hard enough to be able to deliver blood to every portion of the body, all the way down to the feet, to be able to deliver blood back to uh, the heart. Through the, the right side of the heart is going to allow blood to enter back in, that's uh, re blood returning from the systemic circuit, to pump it back out to the heart, uh, to the lungs, hence why it's called pulmonary circulation. The thing about the, in between the atria and the ventricles are the, as well as the other uh, valves, uh, uh, the other input and output of the heart, 
are going to be valves, and they're going to regulate the blood flow in and out of the heart, into the atria, and out into the ventricles. So this is going to govern, when we look at these valves, the direction of blood flow. So the first thing that we're going to discuss are the atrioventricular valves, also known as AV valves. I'll be calling them AV valves for short. And these are going to be the valves in between atria and the ventricles. So while we see them at the top over here, you can see these are the atria, here are the ventricles. We're going to see that on the next slide over. Right atria, uh, right atrium, right ventricle, and here you can see our AV valves. Differences in the AV valves between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, you can see the right will have what's called tricuspid, while the left side will have bicuspid. So what exactly is a cuspid? Cuspid refers to a structure similar to that of a leaf. So here we can see on the right side of the heart, we've got three leaflets, one, two, three. While the bicuspid valve on the left side will only have two leaves. So the reason why they call the bicuspid valve, you might also have heard as the mitral valve, is the bishop's hat, which is called a mitre. And that is two leaflets that come together, and hence where that name came from. Um, the other characteristic uh, for the valves, I'll talk about in the next slide over. The semilunar valves, on the other hand, are the uh, ones uh, towards the back, of which we have the aortic valve, and we have the pulmonary valve. So pulmonary valve for the right uh, pulmonary circuit, aortic valve for the left circuit. So these you can see right up, in, uh, right up next to each other, and they will be opening and closing at different times when the AV valves are opening and closing. So as we start to learn more about the, the, val the, the sounds of the valves, we'll be able to see the two different valves that open and close at different times. And these two images show you very well AV valves opening while our, our, our semilunar valves are closed, AV valves close while the semilunar uh, valves are open. So these are going to contribute to the different sounds of the heart, the lub-dub, if you will. That, and, and from those sounds uh, of the heart, we'll be able to determine the movement of blood through the heart, the different um, things that can take place when normally listening to heart sounds. Uh, one thing that uh, we'll also learn about the governing of blood flow from one side to the next, uh, here you can see a cross section of the heart where we can see the anterior view. We'll talk a good chunk, especially when in our heart lecture, is the movement of blood from one chamber to the next. So how are we going to get blood moving from the left atria over to the left ventricle. And the big idea behind all of this is going to be pressure. Pressure that's involved in moving blood from one side to the next. We're gonna learn about the, the mechanism of squeezing of the left atria, which will push blood into the left ventricle. We'll learn about how the left ventricle fills up. And as that fills up, how do we squeeze blood out to make it out into the aorta to be able to shoot out to the remainder of the systemic circuit. So again, pressures that are going to govern how we get uh, one, blood, uh, one chamber to pump blood into the next, and how we get the ventral to pump blood out into the systemic circuit. Uh, looking at the valves, again, as I mentioned earlier about the pressure, uh, we'll learn about the AV valves. The AV valves are one-way valves in that, in that um, actually all of them, all of them are one-way valves, are both our AV valves as well as our semilunar valves. But the AV valves have specific uh, um, anatomical structures that prohibit it from reopening. So if what we can take a look at in our AV valves, here you can see an example of the bicuspid valve. Again, um, one, one thing I want to go back to, one way that I remember uh, our, uh, which one is uh, which, we know the, trica the tricuspid is on the right, the bicuspid on the left, Something I always remembered a little mnemonic for myself was try right, buy left. And that way you can remember. Try, try right, buy left. Now, uh, here we can see the bicuspid valve for the left side of the heart. Um, you can see the, the two leaflets here. Uh, the, the AV valve, the way that's going to work, in order to get blood to pump from, if this were the left atrium, and then this were the left ventricle, I'll be calling L-A-L-V from now on. Left, at least when I write it down, 
left atrium to left ventricle. In order to get blood to flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle, I'm going to have to exert a good amount of force to open up that valve. So you'll learn about the pressures that are involved to be able to push blood out into the next ventricle. So in order to get that, I'd have to squeeze the left ventricle to push uh, blood through. So as blood makes its way from the left atrium to the, uh, to the left ventricle, here you'll see the bicuspid valve just open up. And that's not going to allow, that's not gonna prevent blood from flowing through. In fact, blood should flow through easily. And what's present on the uh, ventricular side is the uh, presence of muscles. And we know there's muscles as well as tendons involved. And here we have papillary muscles that are present along the wall, uh, ventricular wall itself. And these muscles are combined with what are called chordae tendinae. These are tendons that, that, that project onto the leaflets themselves. So it kind of works like an upside down umbrella where um, when, left, when, when blood flows from the left atrium into the left ventricle, the valve is opened. And so flow should be unimpeded as it flows into the left ventricle. Now what happens when the left ventricle starts to squeeze and the left atrium relaxes, what that's going to do, it's going to force blood only one way. So blood can only flow from left atrium to left ventricle. As this pressure starts to increase, what that's going to do is going to close this portion up. And blood is going to push up against the, the, the cusps and cause it to flap right back up. And the reason it's not going to flap right back open is because the chordae tendinae are literally holding those valves shut. So here, in between uh, in, in our AV valves, Typically, you'll never see blood flowing in the reverse direction. So the, the, the prevention of blood flowing back into the prior chamber allows blood to flow out through the next, next uh, chamber in place. So if this were to draw a very loose diagram of it, this would be our aorta. And this is going to be our aortic valve in place. That's only going to allow blood to flow out in that direction. Now, looking at the semilunar valves, both our pulmonary valve as well as our aortic valve, they actually don't have any anatomical support, meaning they don't have the papillary muscles, they don't have the chordae tendinae to hold it back in place. But if you were to take a look at the structure of the valves, the valves are a little bit harder. Um, but be, due to that lack of anatomical structures, uh, the semilunar valves are typically the ones that need to be replaced more often, specifically the aortic valve. The aortic valve is one in which they, if, if they notice the aortic valve is not closing the way it's supposed to, then it's not that they can't do anything about it. They can actually do a surgery to replace the aortic valve, and typically what they do is they use pig valves for those. They can use um, usually the most common one that they use, because pigs, they can just grab a valve from it and just inject it right, uh, uh, basically sew it right back in place, and then now you've got a functioning valve. Here you can see the uh, movement of blood, and I've got a nice video for you guys afterwards that will show you the direction of blood flow and the way these valves work. Uh, so here you can see blood flowing in. This is blood um, flowing in from the superior vena cava, and I'll talk about these structures later on. Superior vena cava that are going to be filling up the right, uh, the right atrium. And as blood flows through, you can see um, in between, these are going to be our AV valves that are going to be zoomed in right next door. You can see blood flowing in, and as blood flows through, that will allow these leaflets to open, and you can see the chordae tendinae are not very tight at all. In fact, they're very loose, and the papillary muscles are relaxed to allow blood to flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Now, the next portion of the cardiac cycle, again, we'll go into more detail later, but when pressures build up in the ventricle as squeezing takes place, that's going to shut those, those, uh, those, uh, those, those cuspids. They're going to shut it right back up, and you'll see that the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles will be tightened, and that will hold those leaflets in place to prevent that from flying right back up to allow blood to flow back, back in. Now, any dysfunction of the AV valves are gonna create what's called stenosis. You're gonna hear blood leaking back in, things that were, are, are heard during an exam extra sounds during, uh, during an exam where they want to listen to the different chambers of the heart. So these uh, typically are things that fail less, less likely to fail than that of our semilunar valves. 
Here you can see our pulmonary valve uh, uh, taking place. If we're looking specifically at, yes, we're looking at our pulmonary valve. You can see there are no structures contained within. As blood flows through, flows in one direction. And when uh, blood fills up in this area and pressure increases, that's going to cause the flaps to close right back up to prevent blood from flowing back in. So all of these valves, both AV valves as well as our semilunar valves, afford that unidirectional blood flow that takes place. Arteries and veins. Big thing about arteries and veins, arteries conduct blood away from the heart, as well as veins returning blood back to the heart. Do not confuse arteries and veins for carrying oxygen, oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. That's a common thing that, uh, uh, that people will make that mistake on, that veins always carry deoxygenated blood. That's not the case. Um, it's really what governs the name of an artery or vein is the direction of blood flow, whether to the heart or away from the heart. Arteries in general have thick arterial walls and will be able to be subject to high pressures because they're gonna be the direct output of the heart. The one thing I'll talk about is going to be the aorta. The aorta is going to have blood coming out from the left ventricle. So there's going to be this onslaught, this rush of blood flowing through. So naturally, you want to have thick uh, walls that are going to be able to withstand the high pressures that are exhibited. Now, once that blood makes it all the way down the course and making its way back into the veins and draining back into the heart, you'll see that the veins are going to actually have thinner walls and are going to have considerably far less pressure as it, as it dumps blood back into the heart. To give you examples of arteries and veins, you can see our aorta, our pulmonary trunk, and then our coronary arteries. And I'll be able to show you that on the next slide over, where here you can see the pulmonary trunk is the direct output of the, of the right ventricle. So here's our semilunar valve. This is gonna be blood carrying away from the heart. So this pulmonary trunk branches off into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. artery. So this is going to contain um, uh, deoxygenated blood that's making its way into uh, the lungs. So here, this is an example of an artery that's carrying deoxygenated blood. Now, the other uh, artery in this case will be our aorta. It's going to be our biggest artery that's carrying blood out. So this is going to carry oxygenated blood to the systemic circuit. <laughs> blood is being sent out. And this is the, the aorta. Um, you'll see that one of the first outputs on there is going to be the coronary artery. I don't think you can see it on this slide. It's actually on the very back of the slide. Um, the next thing is to look at the major veins. You have the vena cava, the superior and inferior vena cava, and our four pulmonary veins. And again, you can see that on the next slide over. So the inferior vena cava, let's see if we can see it from uh, this slide over, you can be able to see it. Inferior vena cava, delivering blood back from anything below the heart. Superior vena cava, delivering, uh, 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 delivering blood down from any, uh, anything superior, anything above the heart. All that's going to drain back into the right atrium. And again, it's carrying deoxygenated blood. So uh, looking at the uh, pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins are going to be sending blood back from the lungs into the left atria. So these veins are carrying oxygenated blood into the heart. And again, what governs them is the direction of blood flow. Veins going into the heart, arteries going away from the heart. So with this slide, you can see the uh, input and output of the heart based on all, all that information, knowing that arteries deliver blood away, veins deliver back in. You can see the left heart with its input and output. Again, uh, output for the left heart would be the coronary arteries. Uh, which is going to supply blood to uh, the heart itself. I'll talk about that uh, at the end of today. Um, you'll see the other branches over here. I'm not going to have you guys really memorize these because, again, these are more anatomical things. Um, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and so forth. The things that I would like you guys to be very familiar with, maybe not so much the, uh, the branches of the aorta, but know the big structures, the pulmonary veins, vena cavas, um, the pulmonary trunk. That's the big thing I want you guys to remember. And in fact, that's what your homework does. It helps you uh, keep track of all the different structures and know the direction of blood flow. Why is that important? Because as we start to go into the, uh, the, the cycle of the heart, I'm gonna be talking about blood flow for the pulmonary circuit as well as the systemic circuit. 
And I want you guys to be really familiar with that because when we get into our lectures next week, that wouldn't be the time for you to think, uh, oh wait, which direction of the blood flow is it again? Is it, is it the pulmonary veins are going into which direction pulmonary trunk is going where? You want to get a good handle of that because once they start talking about that, you can easily fall behind when you're trying to figure out the orientation of this. Again, stuff that you would have talked about in anatomy, so this shouldn't be new information for you. Um, the blood flow in the heart. Let's see if I can get this video to, to work. Plug this in first. Fairly short video. And then I got one more slide after that, and then I'll talk about a couple of coronary uh, slides, and then we'll be done. Regardless, you can at least see what's happening. And I can describe everything that's taking place for you. Um, you'll be able to see the chambers of the heart, the atria filling up. Then you'll be able to see the next phase where the ventricles are going to be squeezing, emptying blood out. So this is going to take us through the different cycles where the, 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 the atria fill, while the ventricles squeeze. Now we're going to have the atria squeeze, dumping blood back into the ventricles. As the ventricles are going to fill, and then the next step is going to be the squeezing of the ventricles, allowing blood to flow out the semilunar valves. So we'll start to break down all the different chambers as you can see what's taking place. Our AV valves over here, AV valve over here. This would be our, our bicuspid, tricuspid. This is going to be our aortic valve, and this is going to be our pulmonary valve. And all of that, what's going to govern blood flow in unidirectional fashion from left, from a right atria to right ventricle, right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, are going to be those those uh, those valves. And what we'll talk about on Tuesday is what's going to cause the contraction. And as we start talking about the contraction that's taking place on the muscle itself. We'll learn about the pattern that's going to take place in the heart. Uh, uh, the patterns that are going to be exhibited by the heart and the cardiac cycle that ensues. So we'll be able to see the different uh, electrical wave patterns that will take place. So this slide helps kind of draw out the, the movement of the blood for the pulmonary circuit as well as the systemic circuit. Here you can see everything taking place in series, the, the flow of blood as it flows through. Everything that I've drawn out for you in, in blue is going to carry deoxygenated blood, even though we know deoxygenated blood is in blue. This at least helps you kind of point that out, because every image that I've ever been able to find always shows deoxygenated blood in blue and uh, oxygenated blood in red. And here you should be able to follow that circuit when you, when starting off at any point, the right atrium, right atrium goes to the right ventricle, right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries delivering it to, uh, over to the lungs. We're going to see gas, ex uh, gas exchange taking place in, in the lung itself. This is going to be external respiration, which we'll talk about uh, on, on, not next week, but the week after that, next, the Tuesday after. Pulmonary veins are going to be delivering blood, freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs, delivering that back to the heart, where it's going to dump back into the left atrium, from the left atrium to the left ventricle, over the ascending aorta, down to the descending aorta, splitting off from arteries, arterioles, to capillaries. This is going to be internal respiration that's going to take place. And then we're going to be able to see the veins coming back to the vena, vena cava and starting back over at the right atrium. So here you can see that whole pathway as these take place in series and how those chambers, both left and right atria, and both <laughs> left and right ventricles that are going to pump back and forth and you'll be able to see how that takes place on the next slide over. Um, while this circuit is completing, this circuit is completing at the same time. So we'll be able to see how blood is moving in this fashion. As we get the left ventricle and, uh, I'm sorry, as we get the vent, uh, atrium and the ventricles to take place at the same time. What happened? 
<laughs> Did I draw it in the wrong direction? I don't know, you just, it just didn't move your hands. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's what's taking place is is that is a, is a figure eight, and and, and that uh, as as blood is moving through, you're going to see how this is going to work uh, in, in in place. So we're gonna we're gonna talk more about that when we look at our atria as well as our ventricles. Um, we know that our atria are going to contract at the same time, our ventricles are going to contract at the same time. Of which we know the left ventricular side here. You can see why. Uh, if you were to take a note of the left ventricular muscle wall, as well as the right ventricular muscle wall, you can see a clear discrepancy on the thickness of the muscle walls. Why do you think that is? Why is the left ventricle muscle pumps it out to the body, right? So it's got to be bigger. It's got to be stronger in order to deliver blood uh, through the entire systemic circuit. While the right ventricle, literally, I just go right next door. That's all they need to do. So the, it doesn't have to be as strong. Uh, hence, why the right, right ventricular wall is going to be. Um, thinner comparatively to that of the left ventricle. Coronary circulation, again, going to be really quick about it. Uh, you can see our left coronary and right coronary, and this is going to deliver oxygen to the heart itself. So the question is, why does the heart need oxygen uh, when it's carrying oxygenated blood through it? Well, only the very, uh, the, the, the small part of the, the endothelium, the inner layer of the heart is actually going to be able to pick up enough oxygen. but. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, the muscle walls are going to be thick, so they're going to have to have uh, its own circulation in order to be able to supply, because heart never really rests. It's going to continually beat over and over again, so it needs to be able to have enough uh, glucose and have, uh, and have enough oxygen to continually pump and be active. So naturally, the coronary circulation is going to deliver blood flow. It's going to be the first output in the aorta itself. And I'm not going to have you guys break down and take a look at the uh, anterior or interventricular inter circumflex branches. Don't worry about that. Uh, blood's going to, as it makes its way into the coronary arteries, uh, that'll make its way into uh, the heart tissue, and then it's going to collect that blood back up into the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is what's going to dump back right into the right atrium. It's going to deliver deoxygenated blood back to make its way back into the input of the heart would be the vena cava's, coronary sinus dumps in as well, and that's gonna make its way to the right atrium. Um, with that, that tops it all up. All right? So I will see you guys on uh, next Tuesday. Stuff is all uploaded for you guys to review over the weekend. And thank you for your attention. I will see you guys next week.